On this show, we're driven by curiosity. We want to chart a path forward. Best people, best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started. All right, everybody, we are back. We are live. I am Jack Murphy. This is the Jack Murphy Live Podcast. Great to see everybody. Uh, Today, we have a very special guest. I have been asking around for dissident art. We need dissident art. This whole thing we're doing here requires a comprehensive effort, including art, culture, and media. And within there, that includes things like Lil Chad Comic, includes things like Amanda Milius and those folks making movies, Includes visual art as well. And I had not been accustomed to or introduced to anybody in the visual art world on the right side of things until most recently when I met this incredibly interesting and and amazingly talented guy, Arthur Kwan Lee. Arthur, how you doing, man? Great to see you today. Thank you for having me, Jack. It's an honor. Yeah, man. Uh, You know, uh, I've been asking on my YouTube channel and other places to find dissident artists, right? Like we're doing this whole, there's this whole cultural struggle going on right now. And the left has captured all of the institutions, all of the art, all of the media, all of the universities, everything. They make every movie. They seem to make and populate all the art museums, all the galleries. And I've been putting out a call for dissident art. I've heard some good dissident music. I've heard, uh, you know, um, I am Tom McDonald on Twitter. Tom McDonald's been killing it for me on my Spotify list. I'm spacing on a few other names right now. Chandler Crump, a guy out of Florida, 17 years old, putting out hip hop, speaking his mind, being a dissident. And, uh, you know, now I want to talk to you about visual arts and the way that visual arts work in this whole milieu that we're operating in. Uh, And you've got quite a story, actually. And I want to just really start from the beginning, man, because I I want people to appreciate and understand who you are, your art, and that we're not just talking to somebody who's like throwing shit up on the wall. Uh, So let's start from the beginning, man. Tell me and introduce yourself to me and to the audience and how, how did you get involved in art? What is your training like in art? And let's just go from there. And I got a whole list of things. I got a pieces of yours I want to talk about. I've got them all loaded up so we can take a look at them. But let's go, cool. Arthur. Like, how did you get involved in art? What kind of artist yeah. are you? What kind of training have you had? Let's get let's set the stage. Sure. So in my background, just to give a little bit of context in regards to the imprinting and how I have this vantage point. You know, my mother, she's a classical composer and has her dissertation in music theory. And she's a composer at like the university level. So I was always acclimated with the classics and being surrounded by literature and all this sort of romanticism. My father, is, he's a minister. So I often tell people I'm like this visual fusion of them where I'm excavating symbolic ideas and going down this rabbit hole visually. And that's sort of how my voice came to be. But I wanted to originally go into art school to study art history. That was the, the context originally. And... But eventually what I came to see is that I was winning all the painting awards and I was winning all the painting awards because (laughs) the students who are studying art, they're, they're ultimately learning this vogue politics. And when you study art history, you're forced to recognize, you know, pedagogical standards, which implies tradition to it. And when you're painting with that context, you make work that is fortifying cultural value. So I was, I ended up, going, um, dedicating my brush towards the logos, essentially. And this has been pretty much what has caused me to become a controversial figure in the New York City art scene, which surprised me. Let's stop there for a second. Uh, You studied art history. Did you actually like go uh, for fine arts too, like like get a classical education and like paint all the techniques and everything? Okay, color, everything. So what do you mean when you say that you are expressing logos through your brush? Well, if you look at like the greatest masterpieces in all of history, they're always undergirded by masculinity and spiritual excavation. And this is a pattern that I've noticed. And with that said, you know, it all, it all, it's all connected. Like I always wondered why I became more conservative and my reasons are not, because of superior policy implementation or views on welfare or abortion or any of that. It's, I'm 
a conservative for purely aesthetic reasons. And this is something that I feel like is important for people on our side of the aisle to recognize that we need to be able to justify our position for aesthetic and, and cultural reasons just as much as all these political, you know, banter essentially for me. And, and that was my attraction to it, that e even when I was an atheist, I noticed that the imagery that I was most attracted to was during the Christian art period. And I think it's because there's something there that you can't deny. And if you're going to be honest with it, today's art, most of it in the gallery scene, at least, and, I'm, and I've been in the gallery circuit in New York City for 10 years, most of it is garbage. You know, it's, it's, it's trash. Whenever you go into a gallery, Jack, you see all this vague miasmic work and you think, why are they valuing it at this cost, right? <laughs> I'm sure you felt that. <laughs> and yeah, they, they've lost the objective standards. Interesting. Interesting. So, uh, man, we're already off script. What do you mean you were an atheist? What is that? What is that story about? Oh, well, well it's connected for me because I think being a visual artist is a very spiritual route. And, you know, when you study our history, you can't help but see that the most symbolically powerful work was produced from spiritual artists. You know, look at the Pieta, you know, look at um, when, like even even like the Pieta is a very symbolically reverent work. And what it's capturing is this implication of a transcendent morality. And that's what attracted me to all this artistry. And I think it's connected to all the cultural decadence today that we've lost that. And the artists are, you know, they're no longer preserving and they're spreading vanity. And I think the role of the artist this, you know, this being my medium is to be somebody who preserves truth. That, that's sort of the uh, language that I'm, you know, diving into. Preserving truth. Okay. I have a million questions already, but we didn't get to finish setting the table just yet. Preserve, preserving truth through art. Man, you know, if you walk into a gallery today, it seems to me that they're trying to challenge art, challenge truth, challenge reality, challenge uh classical thinking um structure color line form all these things that it seems to me they're trying to just throw those out the window and flush them down the toilet uh and certainly not preserving truth although i guess one may argue that um some of the art that i've seen at like the hirshhorn here in washington dc modern art museum uh that they think that they're preserving some element of truth but to me most of it, st it strikes me as pop pop protest graphic rather than like uh, actual art that's pre preserving truth as you say it. But before we get into that, before we uh, get into, I want to talk more about, I was an atheist, that statement has, <laughs> there's a lot in that statement. Uh, I just want to finish the story about your training and your circumstances in New York city. Right? So like you went to school for art history, you switched it up, you became a visual artist, you studied this, then you, you start making art and you're instantly successful. Like what, what happens? Cause that's, that's probably not the story. <laughs> yeah. So I, I ended up getting, you know, usually around art school, right. When you graduate, uh, if you're going to be an artist, not a graphic designer, or any of these other mediums, you want to get into shows. And typically people are applying for group shows and getting rejected pretty often because that's the hustle you have to go into. And, I, and my face of that was very short. I got solo shows pretty quickly and I had collectors pretty quickly as well. But the more I moved up with this momentum, the more you get acclimated with radical people. And I quickly saw that the art industry is pretty much owned by like anti-American elite people. And, but I was very quiet. I did this sort of social camouflage thing where I knew what I believed, but you know, these sophists are paying my bills, right? So <laughs> I, I was in this place where I basically was um, blending in and just the height of what I was excavating in my art and how it's, and it, a lot of attention associated with it. They gave me artists of the year in 2016 and 2020 from different organizations. And that, that, that implied a lot, but you know, I started to get connected with bigger collectors and influential players in New York City. And eventually, you can't help but be sort of vetted to see if you're going to compromise yourself and live under the shadow for these quick cut bucks. 
And this is something that so many artists have dealt with and a lot of people have become physically compromised or, but definitely ideologically so, where my values didn't line up. And I got to a point where I just sort of let go and decided to go completely independent. And yeah, they, they pretty much ousted me. So 2016, 2020, you're winning awards, artists of the year from various publications and, and authorities in New York city. You're, uh, a, 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 an early success. I mean, first off, most people that do visual arts never make any money or have any success whatsoever. A very few of them make it into group shows and even fewer of them make it into solo shows and even fewer of them end up having established, uh, patrons and collectors, uh, looking to support your work. So that in and of itself is an amazing accomplishment. Congratulations. What do you mean? And now I, I can see how, especially in New York City, the money, the elites, the globalists, they, they have the money and they have the control and they're interested in art, so they're buying art. And the people that buy the art tend to also have influence on the art through their purchases and incentivizing pieces and, and uh, commissioning pieces even, and just through the marketplace of rewarding people that produce art that they like so that they can keep, keep producing more, right? So I can see how you would get sucked up further into the elite world of New York City, Manhattan, and, and essentially the world in that respect. What do you mean by eventually you become vetted? What did, what did you mean by that? I'm, I'm not going to name anyone specifically, but definitely. So the art world is very small. And as you move up there, they're not going to just give anyone a position to you know, launder, launder their art for money, anything of that sort, they're going to make sure that you can be controlled. Um, I can tell you off camera name specifically, uh. <laughs> but, but, uh, I've been to party with known Democrats and I, I mean, it, it, I've, I've been to these circles, man. And I don't think it was hypocrisy. It was ignorant because I didn't necessarily know any of these names. But in retrospect, some of these things start to connect. And um, if you want to make that, there's a certain, there's different levels to the art gallery scene. And the higher you go up, the smaller the circle gets. If you get into that sphere, yeah, they're, they're going to make sure you're somebody who will keep their mouth shut. That's all I'll say. Mm. And were you, were you specifically approached by people looking to launder money through art? It's never that direct. <laughs> it's always like a, it's always a nice sushi dinner, a lot of drinking, and it's always multiple times hanging out. It's never, it's never approached with that, you know, hey, can you do this for me? It's never like that. Even right. when I got blacklisted by all these galleries, it wasn't like, you don't get a letter, right? <laughs> it's more like, they, 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 you know, what, I'll tell you, I was concerned with six different galleries last year, for example, on the early end before they all sort of shut me off. And they all know each other. We all hung out at the same area, that same rooftop bar every Tuesday night, that whole little club, right? And they tell me, listen, um, uh, we'd like to talk to you. I'm like, okay, uh, is it because I went on the Jesse Lee Peterson show, for example? And then, cause he asked me to come on to ask me about stop Asian hate and all this stuff. And I think that's all bullshit. And I'm like, is it about that? You know, is it about more wokeism? Cause I've already lost two galleries who wanted to work with me. They said, no, 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 we just want to talk to you. I'm like, okay, how about you meet me at my studio Thursday evening? He said, no problem. I'm here at the gap. I'm here at my studio. Evening comes around, doorbell rings. He said, hey, we're here to drop off uh, a bunch of work. I'm like, oh, see, one plus one is two. So I've had those kind of situations where, you know, they, they, it, it's like you don't agree with them ideologically. So they basically castigate you and you're not, you know, you're not a part of their cool club anymore. Interesting. Interesting. And yeah. uh, you're not going to say this, but I'll put it into context. There's a lot of discussion these days about the value of one Hunter Biden's art. Right. And so people are trying to understand how and why Hunter Biden can sell a piece of shit for $500,000. And that is just a glimpse into the universe uh, where people produce art to sell it for big money. And then the money flows to a different place besides the gallery. And that is a one way that you can move money around, quote unquote, legally. Uh, and it's it's no wonder uh, that Hunter, art, Hunter Biden's art is under suspicion right now 
uh, given his circumstance and his connections and what one could very reasonably deduce about the New York City art scene and its connection to global money and the globalist and the, the GAE, as Darren Beatty puts it. Um, that's very interesting. I won't press you too much further on that. Uh, well, but- well, I mean, Tom, Tom Wolf predicted this, you know, the American cultural critic. He wrote mm-hmm. The Painted World and he wrote that, you know, he said, just based on this constant need to avant-garde, make this reframing of avant-garde art to be edgy, not based on classical standards. Um, he said that inevitably the radical left would take control of this higher world and, you know, money launder the criminal element. Um, I mean, he, he sort of predicted that this was going to happen. I don't think it would, he understood how far it would go, but he wrote this in the painted word. He said, this is a perfect space for the radical left to go into. And, you know, capitalize essentially. So fascinating. So, you know, my, I studied art history in school too. I went, uh, I did a semester in England and, uh, it was for specifically for art history, traveled, uh, throughout Northern Europe, looking at, at museums on trips in art hith- history as well. And, uh, I became very acquainted with like medieval art and folks like Hieronymus Bosch and others doing really wild, crazy stuff, but still contemporary, still reflecting some element of reality and such. Uh, and I love the art history in this, in learning the history, right? <laughs> like the context and who it was and why, and why did they make this piece and who sponsored it and what impact did it have and where did it hang and what was the influence on history or what was it trying to preserve you know, where we are today? There's nothing like that, right? At least nothing that I have seen. Uh, and it's just interesting to me to see the, and hear from you, the continued devolution, um, and we're, we're going to get to this in a minute. I do want to talk about what is the role of art in general. Uh, in the old days, when there weren't even any books, the role of art was, I think, very well to establish and maintain the establishment. Uh, and then... Well, the role of art should be the preservation of the sacred. You know, when you look at any society, any civilization, any of the ancients, it, they regarded the good, the reason, truth, and beauty as their fundamental building blocks. Right? The ancients talk always about this. And beauty in its purest form is the sacred. And that was a functionality of the artist for quite some time before postmodern art came into the equation. Um, but it's all gone downhill because, you know, they say politics is downstream from culture, right? And political correctness has ventriculated onto the gallery scene. So, you know, political correctness, it's not just a way to make right-wingers shut up. <laughs> it, it's ultimately, it's ultimately a propounder of relativity and what happens is that when you remove masculinity and conservatism you're moving objective standards and what i see is that if you look at any artwork and galleries and you see this this garbage essentially right i would bet that it was produced by a leftist you know i I mean i'm almost certain at this point because i know all these artists and i'll tell you that if a conservative makes art um they're it's something traditional or pedagogically oriented. And I, I mean, I know that for myself, that's the basis of my nucleus from where I'm painting from. And I know that for many artists who have told me the same sentiment. Political correctness. What did you say? It induces relativism. It's a product of relativism. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting because it's not, it, it doesn't compare to a standard. Good point. Okay. I could take that. And you're saying that your, your art today uh, is comparing to a standard, a standard of sacred, of reason, of truth, of beauty, which then, then has. Well, that's what it should be. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, yeah. You, you know, it, it's funny because I, I guess what I'm ultimately saying is that, you know, people who recognize a radical left for what they are, they produce stronger art. They make better art all around. They just make better work. Because even, even the notion of romanticism is, is nested in traditionality in the first place. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, I remember when I showed my work in Art Basel, Miami, 2019. I showed my work in Scope, one of those boots. And I put these gods at war, these ancient Greek figures. And it was very heavy stuff. And the booth next to me was this feminist artist. And she literally had installation art which I have all different gripes about that as well. And there are a bunch of tampons hung from string shoved into a teacup. 
Like, this is what I'm talking about. But what did they say? They said it's bold and daring, right? And then that same, that same year, Art Basel, they sold that banana duct tape to a wall for $150,000. Like, that's not art. That's, there's something else going on there behind the scenes. And people are starting to recognize it. But, you know, as a person who works in the industry, I can tell you that this is due to the left. And um, again, I, I'm, a, I'm, my conservative predilection is based on the fact that they've ruined what I love. You know, they've ruined the arts. So it's not even so much about the difference of solutions economically. It's just the fact that they're ruining beauty. You know, the reason why I'm, I lean towards the right is because I don't want my daughter to have blue hair and a septum piercing and to be 300 pounds. <laughs> you know, but that's okay for them. I think the loss of, of, of beauty is both a symptom and a cause of what's happening. Um, it is part of the mission, I believe, of the progressives, the left, the relativists, whatever, to destroy objective standards, right? Because they want to break us from tradition. They don't want us looking backwards for answers. They believe that the future is just based on an interaction of today with yesterday and doesn't have anything to do with a connection <clears throat> to ancients or to universal truths. Uh, and so part of that political process is by pushing things like fat and healthy at, at any weight, right? You can, you can be 500 pounds and be beautiful. No false, even though that's what they're telling us. Um, you can see it in the art in the way that they just don't adhere to any, as you said, the pedagogical standards. Uh, it's fascinating to, to question which one came first, whether or not it was the desire to separate people from tradition or the fact that the art wandered away from tradition is what is driven driving these politics. I, I don't know that you can decipher that. It seems to be all total. And then you bring in somebody's vision like a Bronze Age pervert who's constantly posting pictures of, of like, uh, you know, jacked and tan and lean dudes. It's super homoerotic, but at the same time, it's like, no, we're talking about standards, objective standards of beauty, of strength, of power, of, of, um, of symmetry, uh, and strength really about strength. And I just had a conversation with a philosopher the other day who I'm having up on the show pretty soon. And uh, he was telling me about how he works out with this bodybuilder and, and a power lifter rather. And I was like, yeah, man, strength training has to be part of our politics. This is why in the liminal order, liminal hyphen order.com guys, the first thing we put in front of people are the fitness standards. It's not necessarily a hundred percent about aesthetics, but it's part of it. The process of producing an aesthetic body brings a discipline and a structure and an order to your life that translates into the politics that I think are appropriate for America. Fascinating to me that this has the same conversation going on in the art world, you know? Uh, yeah. But, you, you, you know, I, I have to agree with you that, you know, what's one of the best ways to take your artistry and I'm speaking like, I can speak as a fine artist, but the way you take your art to the next level, exercise. I mean, it, it, it applies to everything. Uh, I think human beings are much more circumstantial than they like to believe. They did the study in the Telegraph and they measured 150 um, grip strength and upper body strength of men who voted for lower government programs. And then they measured 150 men who voted for higher government programs. And the men who wanted less support from the state, they all had stronger upper body strength and were more athletically sound. And I'm like, there's not, that's not a coincidence. No, there's a pattern there. <laughs> and, and I think that applies to trying to put knowledge height, you need a certain And I'll tell you what, like I have hundreds of sketches and canvases that I have failed at, but that's just a part of the trade, right? You need to be able to step it up from there. Interesting. Uh, and, so and what's the about beauty? Yeah, yeah, beauty by definition is like, is identifiable boundaries refined to like the nth degree anyways. Look at a beautiful car, look at a beautiful Greek statue, look at a bodybuilder. Like, I'm not saying it's, it's you're turned on to it, but you have to acknowledge the aesthetics, right? That's why you're attracted to it, you know?
Do you do you think that our sense of beauty and appreciation of beauty and aesthetics is 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 genetic? It's like built into us. Like where or does it come from the outside? People tell us what is aesthetic, what is what is beautiful. Is it something you're born with? If a baby could express himself, would a baby understand beauty and aesthetics the way that we're discussing? Well, I mean, um, if if you see if you see a a nine or a ten, you know, it speaks for itself, right? <laughs> <laughs> It is I mean, it's, it's as easy as that. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's funny because you were saying it's you're curious what came first. Was it, you know, the arts or the or the po po political change? And I mean, I can speak as an artist. Maybe this is my bias, but I think it's the arts because I always look at the conversation and, you know, I, I try to look at things from like this bird's eye view. And what I often notice is that information is disseminated in two different channels. And one is with the intellect and the other is emotionally. And if you look at the right side of the aisle, we put all this evidence up, we stack it up, red pill data, and we often throw it in this echo chamber, right? And I agree, we need the, data, we need the spreadsheeting and the pie charts for a perspective. But like you said, the, the left has ownership of big tech, the gallery, academia, Hollywood, and entertainment. So they're just using all those spheres of influence, getting all the young people, getting everyone who is not the most interested in politics and having them chant Black Lives Matter or whatever it is, <laughs> whatever the Marxist change, you know, different packaging is. And I think that the reason why I get blacklisted is the same reason why everyone who feels the same sentiment is afraid to speak up. Because when we start going into the creative side, they feel like they own that and they don't want you there. And this is what I've come to see. And I think there's so much novelty there that once we can sort of stop just repeating politics is downstream from culture as this empty mantra and become active participants either by supporting or creating art itself. You know, I get so much excitement, Jack, getting people to like, getting alpha males, like some sort of creative um, medium, you know, once they start participating a little bit, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, can you can, um, I know the answer. So, but let's just humor me yeah. on this question. Sure. It, it is possible to be a masculine quote, alpha leader, male, strong leader and be a painter and be an artist. I know the answer, but let's just talk about why, why is that even seemingly a reasonable question to ask? Right. So, Hey, can well, you yeah, be yeah, well, well, case in point? Obviously look at you. <laughs> I don't know all that. <laughs> uh, well, well, yeah, I mean, I think masculinity is what produces the greatest works of art. And I think the, the problem today, the reason why people even have that stereotype of this beta male cuck who's in his home by himself, um, who can't talk to girls and <laughs> is twirling his hand the whole day, is because the standards have fell so low. And you know, they're trying to please the ideology of the state and the, and the gatekeepers, the curators and the, and the art directors, rather than making challenging work. You know, an alpha male quality is the capacity to endure suffering, interpret it, share it, leadership, and risk taking. When you can consolidate all those elements, you can make the, the height of your projects go to another level. And I'll tell you right now, like, these artists who are killing it in the New York City scene, these, you know, where they're, they're probably like 120 pounds and they just suck up to mommy gallery all day. <laughs> that, that's really what's going on. But historically speaking, the arbiters of, you know, artwork that was put to the top was always masculine entities. You know, the Medici family in Europe, these wealthy patriarchs, military generals in Asia, they're the one, you know, these are the ones who vetted who are the artists that are venerated. But again, it's changed. Why did they commission that art? Let's talk, let's talk about that. Why, why did a Chinese general commission art? Why did the Medici's commission art? Why did the Pope commission art? Why in a time at which very few people knew how to read, there were no books, there were very few painters, that the art that they chose to paint was a triptych of Jesus and like, you know, the Annunciation or whatever. Why, why was that what was commissioned and, and take your pick, whether it's Chinese art or whatever, why at a time, especially when there was no 
commoner access to the means of production of art. Mm -hmm. Why was the only art chosen to be commissioned art that we're talking about? What, that, what, what was the point of it? You know, the whole sentiment of food for the soul, you know, we need to, uh, art, the, the function of art universally, based on the question you asked me, is to fortify the values that you're fighting for. It's, it's, it's along that line. And like, there's a reason why, you know, during World War II, when they were bombing Japan to send a message, who was on the list? Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Kyoto. But all the wise generals stood up and said, we cannot bomb Kyoto because we're going to be destroying beauty. And we'll lose our own sense of beauty then. So all those beautiful architecture in Japan, all, all the, the, those beautiful traditional aesthetics would have been destroyed. But it's one thing to win but it's another thing to lose your own sense of humanity. And I think that's where the artist comes in, or that's where the artist should be coming in, <laughs> in today's climate. I had not heard that before uh, about the target selection in Japan. I'm gonna have to look that up. Maybe somebody in the it's chat can, crazy. can confirm yeah, it, that. It's just, it's just like when I told you about the Pieta, Donato Bramante, uh, he was in charge of demolishing the chapel of Santa Petronilla. And Pieta is one of my favorites. I've studied this history. And he's a very stubborn, inflexible, authoritarian, kind of mean person. But he, even him, he said, we need to rule the Pieta due to the symbolic weight and cultural value it holds. But he allowed thousands of years of art to be put into rubble, though. <laughs> but when an artwork has that transcendent value, and when it's done with such such mastery, you know, that's, you have to preserve it. I really was moved by what you said about art's essential purpose is to fortify your values. That's heavy. I mean, and that actually really well, that's a, an excellent meta explanation uh, that applies to Christian medieval art. Hell, it probably applies to cave art, right? Uh, Christian medieval art, and it even applies to the trash, graphic, dissident, quote, dissident art that I see all over the Hirshhorn today. And they too are trying to, quote, preserve their values, I guess, right? Um, you know, just graphics and prints and just arguing about women's rights, and blah, 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 all the same stuff. It's supposed to be edgy, it's supposed to be out there, but it's really reinforcing the dominant narratives of the day. But really, it's just about individual individual values. And when you have the patrons are the aristocracy, they are the rulers. Well, of course, they're going to want to reinforce their values and fortify their values. Um, I don't know that I had ever considered the fact that um, that masculine energy was essential in order to produce high quality art. Uh, I, I like that idea. It, it's a better explanation to me than people saying that all oh, women were just you know, forcibly excluded from producing high quality art. I'm sure, of course, there's obviously women that can make art. And that's because when we talk about masculine femininity, it's not just binary. These are, these are distributions and people can have varying elements of each inside of them. Uh, and if you don't, you're actually uh, kind of a psycho, right? <laughs> you need to have a balance of all this energy. Um, but it's fascinating to me to think about how uh, the craft and the technique and the adherence to form and beauty uh, were uh, a masculine element. Now, I want to ask you something about something you just said a minute ago, which is we talked about adhering to standards, representing beauty, hitting on common aesthetics, universal aesthetics. But then you also said something about challenging, making challenging art. So if we're talking about a universal standard of beauty, what are you challenging? when you when you say making challenging art then if we're not challenging say what the beauty standards are we're, what, what are you challenging then well you know i can in today's climate um be, you know being counterculture it's all flipped but yeah, I'll, I'll put it this way like the reason why i'm painting all these spiritual and different cultural symbolically reverent imagery is because today the today's dominant narrative is that you know white people are all are all evil 
you know, uh, masculinity is a toxic force stepping on the throats of women. <laughs> you, you know, basically all of these, these nodes of uh, this, this list of victimizing, my whole thing is to sort of counter that. And I think the artist is, is supposed to be sort of overemphasizing something that's underemphasized almost. So mm. I think today, mm. if you're going to challenge the mainstream narrative, you're strangely conservative. But historically, or, or you know, this notion of art being, you know, something dissenting, that's still something more modern. You know, rock and roll or or neo expressionism, like. But that role is very important in art. But if we're going to be honest today, like being a you know, just a man today is to be a defector of the mainstream narrative. Well, if you're going to take that a step further, <laughs> being an artist in that regard and yielding a medium with that spirit, you know, you're, you're, you're going even further with that because you need to yield the, the imagery and symbolism in the masculine spirit now and put it in the public space. So you're kind of going a little bit further in that regard. But I can tell you right now that the new punk rock, instead of wearing a black leather jacket, is wearing a red MAGA hat. And I experienced that going to your brunch. Wearing that red MAGA hat, we're going down the street. Man, I was, you know, some of the other other guys were walking down with me going like, everyone is glaring at you. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> you know? Dude, uh, I love what you just said there about well, hey, let's put this in context. You can use traditional and universal elements of beauty and aesthetics and shape and color and line and form to overemphasize what is underrepresented. That is, that's a great way of putting it. I like that. That's going to help inform me and my, my other cultural projects. Little Chad does not stand up to your artwork, <laughs> but it's, but it's serving, <laughs> but it's serving a similar purpose, which is to overemphasize the underrepresented and to fortify your values. Dude, if we, if we end the podcast right now, that is gold. That is great. Thank you so much. End of scene. Goodbye. Of that was amazing. Now, <laughs> Uh, side note, in the chat, the boys have pulled up. Secretary of War Henry Stimson ordered Kyoto to be removed from the target list. He argued that it was of cultural importance and it was not a military target. Fascinating. Yeah, it's a tremendous story. That's good. You know, you know, that, you know, you know, you know the wise men sit up and go, like, if we lose our sense of beauty and win, we're going to come back and be monsters. That's, that's a fascinating story. I, I, I wish I could believe that if we were faced with the same awful decisions today, that somebody would have that much sense about them. I, I highly doubt that that's the case. I don't think we can figure out how to put one foot in front of the other right now uh, with our military leadership, not criticizing our enlisted men and, you know, the guys out there trying to make it happen, but the guys uh, at the top, like that Millie idiot. Um, all right. Let's uh, let's move on to a little bit more. I, I've got some of your work here, and I want you to talk us through some of it because, bro, first of all, give us the size, the scale, the scope, and then also just what is this? What are we looking at here? So uh, you can see it. Let me make sure I still got you talking. There we go. Your audio is still up. Let me throw this up across the screen so that uh, nobody tries to swipe it. There we go. Look at this, Arthur Kwan Lee. Okay, boom. All right, what are we looking at here, man? Yeah, so this painting, it really embodies the warrior spirit. A big part of my inspiration is comes from the fact that I have a martial art background. Um, lifelong dedication as a mar martial artist at that. And what we see here are central warriors and conquerors throughout history. On the top, we have Sun Tzu, the author of The Art of War. We have William Wallace on the left, Leonidas, Kim Yushin at the bottom, Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan. And in conjunction to all these figures are surrounding the, the, these authorities are apex predators. We have the soaring hawk above that samurai, the brown bear above Wallace, the killer whale, and then that explosive red Siberian tiger coming at you in the center there. And I was trying to capture the dynamism and almost explosiveness associated with you know, the, the more aggressive nature of man. 
and warfare. And this painting was acquired by a Canadian collection. Um, I should ask before I say the name. Well, yeah, and this is a very popular painting, Jack. I mean, dude, that is incredible. And now that you've explained it to me, well, how big is it, by the way? Well, you can see how big my paintings are, right, from the yeah. back here. But this, this one's a little bit smaller. Um, but uh, yeah, this one's um, it's like 36 by 48 inches. So I mean, three by four feet, something like that. It's pretty sizable still, dude. Uh, I'm gonna tell yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, I'm in my studio here. all day. <laughs> I'm in here, like, like people say, you know, you gotta be painting nine to five. I'm painting way beyond that because certain styles require different demands on time management. But with me, you know, I, I had this, I had this 18 year old contact me. He's like, Hey, how, how are you getting solos? Like multiple solos a year. This is, this happened early on last year. And I just told him how many hours a, a day are you painting? <laughs> and he's like, Oh, I'm painting like an hour and a half. I'm like, well, you just gotta, you gotta produce. <laughs> That's what it boils down to. So, I mean, my, my style specifically, there's so much gestural mark making and layering. So just because that the voice in my approach I have, and this desire to constantly compete against compositions in my brain, there's such a demand of time, that tunnel vision, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so that, yeah, that, that thing can go on forever. You really pointed out something that's very valuable that I hope most people will pick up on here. You've got to produce. I remember people come to me and they say, dude, I want to be a writer. I'm like, well, how often are you writing? They're like, you know, it's here and there. I'm like, well, if you're not literally writing every single freaking day, you're not a writer and you don't really want to be a writer. I'm a writer because I have an uncontrollable urge to express myself through words. I can't stop it. I can't help it. I have to it's write. Beautiful. I have to yeah. write. If, if I'm not writing uh, a book, I'm writing an essay. If I'm not writing an essay, I'm writing an email. If I'm not writing an email, I'm writing Twitter. If I'm not writing on Twitter, I am writing in my journal. Like I can't, I literally can't shut up. <laughs> I can't you shut up. Jack's talking about? There's an essence to what you're talking about also that is so deep, which is that like, like what, this is what I'm saying. Like, I love what you just said. Like, I don't care what the means, writing, painting, acting. I don't, some sort of creative expression is so important to be holistic as a man. Young talks about this, right? You need to exercise that magician archetype. Something creative will give you so much joy that, that the pleasure of the body is, is amazing, but the pleasure of pride in a discipline, that is a good self. Like I live for that. I live for that, you know? And, and that's what I like, like my hours in the studio will be any body count or anything that these pick up bars or anything, try to tell me it's all irrelevant. I'm like, I'm in heaven when, it, I mean, when it, when it works out, you know, sometimes, <laughs> pain, so <much> <laughs> sometimes I'm in hell though, you know, dude, uh, <laughs> I, I want to address something you just said. Um, pleasures of the body are good, but they get old. The pleasure of, of discipline and expression beats that by a million. Uh, you're absolutely right. And, and I gotta say, like, I have gone through phases in my life where I relied solely on pleasures of the body, uh, super hedonistic, uh, sort of, uh, certainly not compatible with a lot of the politics that I would, that I, I believe in today. It was a different time in my life. I was a different person. I was working through it, you know, and I don't regret any of it. Um, I, I just know that it was like a passing moment in my journey and I had to, I couldn't take anybody's word for it that like hedonistic pleasures of the body run dry eventually. I couldn't take anybody's word for it. I had to literally experience it. And I have, like I've gone to the nth degree in every which way you could possibly think of pleasures of the body in every way. And I realize now I actually get more pleasure out of focused, productive work, spirituality, connection to God or creator or a larger higher power community, reaching out to people, expressing myself, respect, respecting myself and others. Yes. Fasting, you know, withholding from myself. Like these are ways that I get much better return on my time and energy. And, um, no one could have told me and made me listen. I'm too stubborn, right? I'm too stubborn. If somebody would have been like, yeah, buddy, you know, you're just going to get tired of doing all that sex and meeting all those girls and eating all that food and drinking all that wine and spending all that money. You're going to get tired of it, man. You're going to get tired of it. Trust me. Just skip all that. You know, go right to virtue. 
I don't blame you at all. It's it's almost like it doesn't look as sexy because you don't see these externalities of you don't you know there's no muscle car there's no um no muscle bound you know there's no, there's there's not lascivious woman around you it's in here it's in here and you know um I think it's one thing to to not have the option to do so right but I mean I think it comes from I think it's necessary to go through that though I I don't know I mean like that makes my art a lot more deeper because. The psychological trials associated with it. So I, I think it's important, but I think eventually there is a graduation point where you realize, no, everything is in servitude to me being centered and practicing my discipline. Eventually you get to that psychological frame. And, you know, being here in New York City, I often meet like men in the, like their, like literally like their late fifties, Jack, who are still like talking about, oh, look at this 20 year old that I'm trying to have sex with him. I'm like, this is New York City. It's it's ridiculous, right? And it's clown world, brother. I'm I'm in the belly of the beast, by the way. You know, <laughs> you are. You, know? you and me both, dude. New York City, Washington oh, right. D.C. Okay. as as blue as it gets, and uh, it wow. it's a. Uh, it's refreshing to have this conversation. I, I haven't had the particular, the right forum for me to express about my evolution and like that process through hedonism and that process through pleasures of the body. Um, where I worked through it to come to a greater, more holistic and deeper appreciation for virtue, for discipline, for expression, for hard work, for connection to universal truths, for history and ancient philosophy. I haven't, if you would have foisted that upon me at 25, I would have been, I would have rejected it, which I did. I did reject it. Uh, but I, I feel like because I, personally experienced the exhaustion of the pleasure of the body that my appreciation for the pleasure of the soul or if that's even a words you could say together uh is much deeper and much more profound and um i think that you can see that in people that serious take their art seriously too uh we were talking earlier about salvador dali you know he started i went to the salvador dali museum in uh, st petersburg florida freaking amazing okay everybody should go there and not because of the surrealism he starts off doing studies and portraits like everybody else there's a bunch of bowls of fruits pictures of dudes self-portraits etc he gets into the mind bending clock melting totally trippy surreal blending of dreams and it seems like drug uh, you know drug trips and whatever and i'm going to put something up here he ultimately comes to images like this one evolution yeah Okay, so here we are. We're now we're talking about Christian art. All right, we got the Last Supper here. And then this one, this one just blew my mind. This is like 40 feet tall. Okay, it's like 40 feet tall. It's freaking gigantic. I mean, I don't have to explain to the audience here. Uh, I'm sorry for the podcast listeners. Please check it out on YouTube, guys. Um, the Christian iconography, you've got, you know, looks like Jesus, you got Mary, you got Christopher Columbus, the cross, I mean, armies marching across the ocean. I mean, wow. Right. And so even a guy like Salvador Dali, he worked through all of this in his art and late in life comes to want his main goal is to produce these gigantic works of art that represent traditional values, Christian values and history and exploration and masculinity and, and risk taking and all these things. Uh, fascinating to me that, a guy, and, and you know about Dali, no one talks about that part of his career. All of the prints that you see around and everybody thinks like, oh, Salvador Dali, he's that like surreal mind tripping, you know, no rules, bending, melting clocks guy. When at the end of the day, he turned out to be a guy producing traditional art just like that. Yeah, that was the height of his artistry. If you look at it from a technical perspective, I mean, as a painter, that was it. That was his height. And that was also when he started to think and meditate more on the finitude of his life. You know, I actually had, I have a friend, she's much older, but she remember Dolly coming to New York City being this rock star artist, the man walked around with an armadillo on a leash and like these three French girls, it's like some weird off the top, I guess like rapper stuff. <laughs> and, and um, But she said, he's come to New York regularly because he had so much business there. 
But as you got older, all that stuff started to go away. It can be more serious. And, you know, it's, it's, it's what we're talking about, a return to tradition. He started to tap back into that. And personally speaking, like the, the, the work he just showed me when he started to become more specific about his religious iconography, that is the strongest work, Jack. Like, in my opinion, I, I don't care about the melting clocks and all that. I mean, that's great. And, you know, the notion of interpretation of dreams is a whole subject of that in regards to art making. But I have my psychedelic phase with art, too. And I, you know, I've, I've been there. And my belief is that when you get the message, you hang up the phone. I understand it. <laughs> Mind altering it. On to the next one. What are you doing to preserve social cohesion? How are you using your art to support the fight? Right? Not that you should be thinking about the fight. You want to produce art cathartically. But the production of art comes from the value still. So that's, that's been my whole thing. And I think we're going to get to a point where, and we are getting there too. In the art world, you see this. In the fine arts here, you are seeing this, this separation, this contrast. And all the artists who believe in traditionality, who are embracing a lot of this you know, modernity that we see, are producing stellar art, but they can't get representation. <laughs> so they're going to all go independent. I almost want to encourage all the creative people listening, tuning in here. I fuck the record labels, fuck the galleries, you know, fuck the managers. It's better to just fly solo and consolidate with your own. And there's a big lesson in that in regards to the fight too. We need to consolidate and we need to do what the left is doing and take a page out of their book because they're effective because there's a strategic tactic that they're using effectively that we need to tap into. It reminds me of a song, a line in a Tom McDonald song where he says, uh, I'm independent because I can go viral. You're independent because nobody will sign you. <laughs> That's it. That's it right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you know, I remember, I remember Jack, when I got, um, canceled by all these Lower East Side galleries, they pretty much told me like, you know, you're still salvageable. You can come back in, you know, this, that, and the other. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, if I do that, I'll never get any work anywhere. And I know what they're trying to do, you know? But even before I was working with the galleries, I already had, like, a solid base of collectors, and I was looking at them. And they're all, like, pretty much alpha males. They're all, like, military veterans with entrepreneurial spirit. They're, like, some MMA guys. Like, they're all people who, who aren't looking to – be brainwashed by the state and i that's a pattern there you know why because i'm painting the sacred i'm painting something that you know it takes gonads to lift heavy weight and to train but it also takes gonads to look within right so that's a that's a quality that requires discipline and because my painting is an installation of this discipline it can't help but connect i think i love it uh, I'm I'm reminded of this uh my a new twitter follower a mutual i have athenian stranger uh, very clearly a well-considered philosopher. Uh, I sat in on a Twitter spaces he did about Strauss and Jaffa and traditional, you know, philosophy and, and ancient virtues and such, and, and how they translate into modern times. And then I started clicking around and, uh, there's images of him wearing a rogue shirt in the gym and he's jacked, dude, he's jacked. And I was nice. like, this is a guy I gotta get to know, uh, because I think in, in order to be, and I'm living this, I'm trying my best in order, in order to truly be a leader in this movement, whatever you want to call it, you got to do the whole thing. It's the whole package. You gotta, you gotta have your body together. You gotta have your brain together. You gotta have your soul together. You gotta have your emotions together. And if you can integrate those four, man, this is a tough challenge, right? Like, I feel like in the past you could get by with just one or two of those. You could still be a happy, productive you know, citizen. But today, in order to be a leader, you got to be a renaissance room, man. You got to be a renaissance man <laughs> and you got to be integrated in all those four areas, mind, body, soul, and uh, your emotions. Integrated. And uh, Isn't it I, interesting, Jack, when you describe those four different uh, frameworks about being in shape and all, you just described the book King Warrior Magician Lover. You need to have some sort of leadership in your life. You need to be in shape, some kind of physical tension, the warrior. You need something creative. You're a writer, the magician, and the lover. You need to also be an example in that regard. 
it's, it's interesting. And, and this is why the archetypal truths are important. You need to embody it, but holistically. And I mean, I do it for selfish reasons. It's a fulfilling way to live, but it also makes you a damn good example. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Why not? Indeed. Uh, and you know, that's what I didn't understand about virtue in the past. It sounded to me like a prison. Like, do, do these things, you know, the virtue, morality, you know, doing the right thing. Not, not that I was always hell-bent on doing the wrong thing, but I certainly rejected authority. I still, I still do. Uh, but it seemed like uh, it was about deprivation. It seemed like it was about keeping you away from the good stuff. But I have come to realize through my own stubborn, hard-headed, kicking and screaming, even because people will tell you this point blank, it's written, it's very simple. If you lead a virtuous life, it's actually the key to unlocking the good life. And life actually gets easier and better. It's better that way. I, had n yeah. I, I just didn't know that. And I don't know if that was um, a product of like bad education, a lack of education, poor role models in my life. Uh, but, uh, virtuous living to me sounded horrible. That sounded awful. And now I understand it's like the cheat code to being fulfilled and being fulfilled and actualized is way better than being satisfied, right? Like the pleasures of the body, it could only be temporarily satisfied. I'm more interested in how do I fulfill my soul today? Amen, brother. And, uh, it's, it's a wild experience. And have you always felt this way too? Or what was your well, evolution? I, I, think, I think I was, I think a lot of it wasn't, I mean, I was lucky in the fact that I fell in love with the discipline very early. And I think that is, that's not up to me. We'll call that God. We'll call that, you know, I discovered something that my heart resonated with. So I think I got lucky in that regard. But then there's also the um, good parents don't hurt, you know? <laughs> uh, and, you know, my, the way, like, for instance, I sort of tuned out of uh, this, you know, the, the hookup culture phase, even with having so many beautiful women at my axis, being a young guy who's getting solo shows that usually people twice his age get. Like, I think was the fact that I never felt like I had to explain what makes, you know, things that make me happy. And I've sort of sensed like a logical fallacy of voting as a conservative and speaking of social cohesion whilst participating up in hookup culture. And I think this is the biggest challenge I see in the manosphere, actually. I think that's a contradiction. Um, it's, it's, and I think they're blindsided and they're only half correct because they are correct that masculinity is conservatism. But I think that they're also missing the point by telling men to use women as emotional punching bags because they don't, they're afraid of intimacy. <laughs> I agree. So, so, so I, yeah, it's, it's a big challenge that I felt. And I think that in conjunction to the fact that I just love what I do. I mean, I love painting. Like I love making art. Like that sort of was my saving grace. Like I don't need to hurt anyone and I can be having a great time by myself mixing colors. What the hell? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. but, but I will say, I think that that ritually defined age, you know, when young people see this order and they're being told, hey, this is the way to go. This is why guys like you, Cernovich, you guys are passing the torch for saying, no, it's not like a wagging finger thing. It's just, it's actually much more fun. And, and, and that's the beautiful thing about it because now you can present it that way. And I've been trying to do that with my art, like all the spiritual imagery, but with the colors of like a bag of Skittles or something. I'm trying to make wisdom sexy. You know what I'm saying? So, because like I was, I was contacted by this young guy. He goes, look, I have your work as my wallpaper on my phone and I love the colors you're using. It's, it's explosive. And then I'm like, yeah, but you've also been looking at like an image of Christ for like how many months now? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You feel that. That, so, so I'm trying to package that with the aesthetics. Heavy. That's heavy. That's beautiful. That's kudos, dude. That's exactly yes, exactly what we need. And that's exactly, exactly why we're talking. I'm going to take a quick tangent, manosphere, red pill stuff. 
the inherent problem with everything that they talk about is if they encourage hookup culture, if they encourage using women, as you said, temporarily even, what they're, and, then, and then also saying, I'm only going to marry someone with a low body count. What they're saying is, is they're create what I call they're creating the, the reserve army of useless sluts. What they're saying is, is that in their social construct and their idea of society, that there has to be a group of women that are used nothing more than stepping stones on your way to wherever to find that wife that you're supposed to have. And that there needs to be a reserve army of useless sluts in order for these men to be fulfilled. And that was a contradiction that none of them could ever get past. And that's why I don't associate or affiliate with any of those guys anymore. And it is a dead end thought process. Uh, also why the manosphere is on its way out or dead. Even some may say, um, one I want to circle back and drill down on though. That's a total side note. And producer, don't clip that one. That's a that's a hidden gem for people who are listening. Here. <laughs> um, the uh, you you said that the discipline. I mean, I'm not one of I'm not like a Jack. I mean, we spoke, brother. Like, yeah. I'm a masculine artist, but I'm not one of these pickup kind of like. I know yeah. who I am, and I've always been public about it since day one. So I, I know what, exactly what you're getting at. Yeah. Yeah, but let's put that aside. Let's get back. To, let's get back to the. All you right, you right. said something very <laughs> profound. You said something very profound that the the discipline of your art led you to where you are as a human being today, which is finding pleasure in your expression and finding pleasure in your truth and in beauty and in in production. Uh, the discipline as a as a a word for a thing you do and then discipline as a word for the way you attack it. These things are the action that lead to the results that we're talking about, right? So it's, 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 it maps onto physical uh, exercise as well. If you develop, if you do, if you engage in the discipline of, of powerlifting and you attack it with the discipline of consistency, it produces something inside of you that is difficult to attain elsewhere. Uh, do you hear a resonance there between your work, your discipline? I feel oh, it too okay. in my writing. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I think um, one thing my collectors often say is your work is like, it's like how are you able to apply so many different principles and imagery and color combinations all at once? And eventually, if we have a lo long enough discussion, I end up attributing it to like my martial art background. And they'll go, oh, what the hell? <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about exactly. Because the universality is that, you know, if you want to produce anything, anything whatsoever on any field, this is just a universal thing, not to be too meta, but it's, there's two principles I believe in when it comes to art making and it applies to my practice as a judoka, it applies to my weight training. It's two things. One is you need to learn the rules to break the rules. So you need to learn the rules first if you want to produce anything of caliber. You can't just go in there and expect. Imagine I'm teaching some young artist. And, I, and he says, I want to paint the dark side of my soul slaying a dragon. Well, you need to first draw this bowl of fruits. Okay? <laughs> Can you first do that? <laughs> it's, it's reality. I, and I had this exact situation, and he looks so heartbroken. I'm like, listen, no, no, no. Once you have this tool belt, you can apply it on any of your art making. And then, and then it clicked for him. But I've had the situation. And then the second thing is that long-term consistency beats short-term intensity. These are two things I believe in with my work. There's times for intensity. When I used to compete in judo, you know, obviously the months before the competition is when you go hard. But overall, it's just about making sure you get the, you put in the hours, you get the muscle memory in, and the necessary pitfalls you have to go through, but you're consistent, right? And I think those two mantras are sticking with it, are, are important for producing anything of high standard. And I can say that as a painter, I can say that as a person who's, you know, been venerated by the art world. And I can say that with somebody who had relative success fighting, but my brother kept beating me because he was in my weight class. <laughs> <laughs> that guy was just faster than me. You know. <laughs> you know, the beauty of physical combat sports is you get to a point at which somebody beats you because they're better or faster or stronger. And the only thing you can do, if you've all both trained, you just tip your hat, man. 
uh, that that is that is the beauty of masculine competition that if it's done with honor and dignity and with discipline and effort no matter who wins at the end there's a mutual respect that is created uh, I've been a fighter I mean not a pro fighter but I've had amateur Muay Thai fights I trained Muay Thai many years and uh, you know the feeling that you get at the end of a fight with a guy that you didn't know beforehand you just fight you want to hug you want to hug the guy basically afterwards right. there's like this incredible mutual respect that is born and in I bet the you they both I bet you you and the other guy voted for Donald Trump <laughs> this is another thing I've noticed with so many martial artists. Yeah. I've noticed this. Yeah. You know. Uh I think I think a lot of uh a lot of people that are focused on their physicality, focused on competition, focused on honorable competition, understand what the right can bring and definitely don't want what the left can bring. Um I want to touch, dig a little bit deeper, or just refer to a couple of things that you said here. Uh, learn the rules to break the rules. I'm in the, I'm in the uh, teaching my kids that you have to break the rules phase. And they're like, but dad, I thought you told me I had to follow all the rules. I'm like, no, you have to learn them first before you can strategically break them in order to achieve something important. And they're beginning to understand that. They're beginning to understand that. And then we talk often about on this show uh, and on Twitter and wherever on about the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. But I think what Arthur and I are both talking about here is turning that around. I prefer to act first. Take action. Paint that bowl of fruits. Lift that five-pound weight. Take action and once you take action, then observe what's going on and make that change and then reorient and then keep going. But don't get stuck in the observe orient phase. Don't get stuck trying to figure things out. Act. Because when you act, it changes you, it changes your environment. And then you begin a process of evolution uh, and refinement uh, that you've obviously uh, employed here. Very interesting conversation. And it was very difficult for me to, to, for me to develop my style. Like, you know, people often, they don't understand the, 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 the pitfalls and, inad, inad, you know, inadequacies that I had to deal with in my painting style to get to where I'm at. Like, I remember, um, I, I trained under this four foot, very strict Korean grandma who took no shit. And if I didn't do something properly and articulate it well with my brush, she would like get so mad, but <laughs> that context now, because of that, I can render anything, right? right? So Clearly. you don't see it when you're there, but when you want to, I don't know, paint Hercules or, or uh, the Sistine Chapel, whatever it is, like you, you're like, you can go back to that place and you can apply those principles to everything. So that's it, brother. Yeah. You got to pull the trigger and um, build. Indeed. And then in all the experts in every field understand that the most important thing to do is go back and hit on the basics and drill the basics. And I think it's because the more you learn, the less, you know, so cliched and the more expertise you become in a field, uh, the more important you understand the, the foundational elements that go into any craft. I remember reading recently, uh, somebody critiquing new writers and the new writers would say things like, well, this is just my style. You know, this is just my way of breaking the rules and expressing myself. And you know, the guy responded very, very accurately. And he's like, no, this is you just not knowing what to do. And this is you just spazzing out all over the place. The first thing you have to do is learn how to write with strong subjects, strong nouns and strong verbs. That's it. That's the first thing you have to figure out. And then from there, you can make changes when you can, when you can master the basics, then you can find places to express your style. Oftentimes in my writing, I'll write sentences with no verbs or with no nouns or run on sentences or multiple clauses of and, 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 and. But if you look at it more deeply, there's actually rhythm to it. There's a meter. There's a, there, there's, 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 maybe it's staccato this time. Maybe it's legato this time. Maybe it's, you know, eight syllables on this side of the conjunction and eight syllables on that side of the conjunction. Sometimes when I'm really getting into it, and this mostly comes in the editing phase, I will write sentences on, on purpose that go words that go five syllables, four syllables, three syllables, two syllable conjunction, two syllables, really? three syllables, four syllables, five syllables. And when you read it, you don't notice it. But what you do notice is a fluidity and a rhythm that comes to it. And there's no, I remember when I first started to write, I tried to do stuff like that. And my, my wife to be 
Red Hen, she edited my book. She edited Democrat to the Poor. Well, and I would, I would, and she edited all my early blog posts as well. And I would, uh, I would submit stuff to her and she'd be like, this is, what are you, what are you, what are you trying to do here? And that's because I hadn't refined myself as a writer on the basics at that point. But now that I got the basics mastered, I can do all that weird stuff that you don't even really notice, but it fits because it's rhythmic and it's clear and it's, it just goes right into your consciousness and it doesn't just stand out as being something weird on purpose. And I think in, in a lot of ways I'm looking at, you know, let's go back to this piece with the, with the, uh, the historical figures and the animals. Um, you know, when you first look at it, it's hard to see all the things that you're talking about, but once you have that context and begin looking in there, it all just sort of flows into you. The energy flows right into you. And, I wouldn't say, I would argue that this piece probably isn't like necessarily traditional. I mean, the gestures and the color and all this, this is, this is not like a, a, you know, 12th century triptych, uh, with gold, gold leaf on it. You know what I mean? This is like, yeah. this is, this is an evolution in really technique. Pain, baby. <laughs> yeah, it's an evolution in technique. Uh, but it's one that can only be had, uh, by mastering the basics. Let me put that out there again. Beautiful. And studying the masters. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about another piece. Let's talk about another piece. Uh, let's talk about this one. This one I have a special attachment to. All right. There we go. Oh, come on. You, you, this one <laughs> speaks for itself. Talk, um, talk, talk us through this one, dude. Yeah. So I'm a member of the Liminal Order, of course. And this is a hyper intense animation of uh, the logo with a lot of imagery in the background based on the interview and orientation conversations that I had. So this is both personal, but also has public renditions involved as well. So we have the all, we have the eye of uh, being awakened here. And before I knew it was a raven, I just, I wasn't sure which bird it was. So I just kind of made this like Phoenix looking bird. <laughs> It works. And then, uh, for sure. And, uh, you know, I, I had so many conversations with the Luminal Brothers, and we have some, you know, it, it all comes, the universal thing with every conversation I had, the dialogues, it all centrals on this idea of fighting for what you believe is right in your heart. And that inevitably today is going to have elements of patriotism, you know, uh, Christ consciousness masculinity and, and the warfare associated with it, wisdom, uh, preserving that is sacred. So we have an angel in the corner. We have a Buddha to the left corner. We have lions fighting Christ right next, right behind the bird. We have a, we have a person's body on top of the eye, like an exorcist, like the, the, the demons are being cast out of them, which is what happens when you associate and congregate with people who are supporting your values analogously. And then, of course, the Battle of Iwo Jima, the raising of the flag, to the right there. So this is an amalgamation of, you know, the sentimental. That's amazing. I love it. And the Phoenix works. I mean, we are, we are collectively going through a Phoenix moment. I personally have gone through Phoenix moments myself very publicly. And uh, it, it works. That, that works for me. I love it. I love it. I want it. I want it. Yeah. Uh -huh. I will talk later. Okay. <laughs> I want it. I, I, I need, I need a bigger wall though. I think this is one of, okay. of some size. Is it not? Th this one's, I think like 36 by 40. I can't remember. I ha I'll have to, um, have a double check, but, uh, we'll talk. I'll have to find a place for that. Uh, I appreciate you mentioning the LO guys, you know, Arthur is the type of dude we've got in the LO. These are the type of things that we're considering in the liminal order. These are the conversations we're having. This is our goal. This is our intent, you know, direction through discipline, moving past hedonism and putting that beside you, looking for spiritual fulfillment and legacy. Uh, we're looking to change the political environment that we operate in through changing culture. Um, we're not just, uh, you know, I don't know what people may think about us, but this is the kind of conversations that we have inside the LO all the time. Where can people find you right now? Cause they know where to find me, but where can people find you? Where are you putting your stuff out there? Yeah. Just, um, Arthur 
for my website, all platforms, Arthur Kwon Lee. Twitter is very new because I got my Twitter deleted when I said something about Black Lives Matter. So I started to back up recently. But I was very MIA on Twitter. But I, uh, I'll pick that back up. Instagram, Arthur Kwon Lee. Uh, yeah, that, those are uh, pretty much everything, Arthur Kwon Lee. Beautiful. And you guys, the liminal order, you can just Google that. Check it out. Also, Arthur came to Jack Brunch in New York. We had an amazing time there. We're going to well, Tampa. Fun, We're going to Tampa this weekend. You know, I just know I got a notification. Uh, Cortez met us up there. AJ met us in New York. He's coming to Tampa too. Uh, so we got Tampa going, and two weeks after that, uh, we've got Nashville on the twenty fourth. I'm gonna send him an envy message. <laughs> we've got <laughs> we've got Nashville going on the twenty fourth. We've got Austin coming up after that in the first part of December. We've got Northern California, uh, or sorry, the first part, yeah, first part of November. November rather is Austin. Then we've got California, Northern California, in the middle of November. Eventually, we're going to make it to Los Angeles, Denver, and Seattle, and then back to Washington, D.C. on February 27th, I believe, is going to be the final Jack Brunch on this tour. It's going to be massive. My estimates, we're talking maybe a couple hundred people coming out for that one. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Uh, I'm not ready to wrap this up, dude. I want to talk more. I want to talk more art. What are we looking at here, my friend? Uh, this is a very popular one titled Rebirth. So... I, you know, some of the, uh, it's funny because I regard like the most prominent alpha males actually as Christ, Buddha, Moses, and Martin Luther, just by reading their writings. I, I think uh, everyone thinks of Genghis Khan or, you know, um, I don't know, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, conquerors, but I think it takes way more going out to go within and anybody who has experienced psychedelics or linguistic connections of certain readings knows what I'm talking about. So we have this Siddhartha Buddha in the center here. And all of these women are surrounding him, beautiful renditions of women kind of camouflaged in the mist. But the whole idea of separating from the material world and going within should be a part of a man's journey. And that's why there's doves flying up as you look at the composition there's a weightlessness associated with it you know the whole idea of joseph campbell talks about mother nature and father culture and i think it's because there's patterns here and that implies separation from the mother material matter and going within towards the understanding recognizing your internal patterns you know the the, the paternal and it's that's uh the spirit behind his composition check separating from the material heavy dude damn what did you yeah, say this is uh that's the way brother fortifying your values overemphasizing what's underrepresented challenging people yet adhering to standards of beauty and aesthetics uh that is phenomenal dude you uh you are the real deal, my friend. Not that you need huh. me. Not that you Thanks need me. Know, brother. <laughs> Not that you need me <laughs> to give you that uh, affirmation. But I mean, man, there's a lot of junk out there in every aspect of every media. But this is a uh, or every medium. Uh, but this is really fantastic stuff. And getting to hear you explain it in the context of our conversation, in the greater context of our po political and cultural conversations, uh, really makes it much more meaningful to me and i hope to the odd i hope to the audience as well guys you know i was talking about looking for dissident art and uh here's arthur right here in the lo we've been talking about getting him on the show uh, i wanted to meet with him in person first and we did we've hung out a couple times now in miami and in new york and uh brother i gotta say this has been a really meaningful and important show for me uh, i was touched and moved at a number of moments throughout this. You've said some very profound things and extremely relevant. You're obviously a master at your craft. You're living the struggle on a daily basis. You've worked your way into this mindset, which I really appreciate. And uh, it's just been an honor and a privilege to get to know you and to talk to you on the show. and you know, to call you a friend and a brother and to look forward to moving into the future 
uh, cause there's a, we got a long way to go, dude. We're sitting here talking like a couple of old men. I'm probably a little bit older than you, but uh, we still got decades and decades and decades of this dude. So, uh, I'm, I'm really hopeful for the future. If I got guys like you with me and I'm here with you as well. So that's the power of brother. Yeah, you, you, you know, man, after my own heart, look, um, likewise, brother, I'm, I, it's, it's important to consolidate with men of like-minded values, not to be so dramatic, but you know, I have a collector in Australia and we had this conversation about, you know, you want to you want to be with people with analogous values. So you can't be outnumbered by the state. <laughs> and I know that sounds dramatic, but what happened to France happened to Australia and it's coming. Indeed. Indeed. It's inevitable. It is. And that is why men of honor and courage and strength and mastery need to come together and express their loyalty, their service to each other, perform accountability, create community so that we can then end up as sovereign as one can be in this day and age. <coughs> Excuse me. And those are the three core values of the liminal order, masculinity, brotherhood, and sovereignty. We believe that they add on to each other and lead to personal sovereignty. As we've discussed, <coughs> excuse me, the foundational elements we believe also need to be integrated. You need to be an integrated whole of mind, body, spirit, emotion, all these things together, your intellect together, integrated. We've talked about that thematically throughout this entire show. You've expressed it in your art. I love the congruence. It makes this job in my life so easy. There's nothing to uncover. There's no weird potholes we're going to come across. Being an honest man, an authentic man is difficult at once because of the reaction you get in the world, but it's the easiest way to carry yourself. You don't have to remember what you said before. You just be you authentically That's in right. every instance and uh, your true higher self can come out. Arthur, I really truly sincerely appreciate your time and energy today everybody you can go find him uh at arthur kwan lee that's k-w-o-n-l-e-e.com follow him on instagram go to his website sign up for his list um you know get involved i'm going to promote your twitter we'll get that thing bumped up a little bit those are rookie numbers i see up there buddy rookie numbers yeah yeah i'm rookie on that man but um, <laughs> we'll get that pumped up this is what it's about, man. You know, we got to speak up for what's right. Amen, brother. Really appreciate that. Guys, liminalorder.com, liminal-order.com. Check us out, Brotherhood, Masculinity, and Sovereignty. Jackedbrunch.com for food, fellowship, and fun all around the country. People come together. They drink some wine. They break some bread. It builds bonds that cannot be broken. I can't stress this enough. Please come out and see us. Tampa on 1010, Nashville 1024, Austin 1106, uh, and then Northern California 1120, Sausalito, I believe. So check it out, guys. I really appreciate it. Arthur, thank you so much. Everybody, we are out. Whoa, wrong one. <laughs> we are out now. On this show, we're <laughs> driven by curiosity. You want to chart a path forward? best people, best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started. 